Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Today we are gonna go over uh, the real estate cycle. We're gonna go over commodities. We're gonna go over how all this is interconnected. And I like to revisit this when we see um, some weakness in the markets uh, or if we're just kind of moving sideways, it's always good to revisit the real estate cycle, the thesis, I call it the thesis of the channel, kind of how we invest, how this is all interconnected, demographics, inflation, interest rates, uh, and, and how this all works, and how it's all interconnected, uh, and the data behind it. If the reason this is so important to go over is because the, the general overall guideline, like what's guiding my viewpoints, is this. If we get certain conditions, that is basically what pushes that inflation into the system, which increases interest rates. And I'll show you how this is all at least connected together um, from what I have looked at from the data and what my interpretation is of the data. So we're going to go in here, we're going to go over what I consider to be the thesis uh, and kind of evidence that we see in the markets that either supports or denies the evidence that I or the data that I've got here. So let's dive in. Let's take a look at all this different stuff. And I'm going to interconnect this whole big story uh, of a lot of the stuff that I've looked at, looking at history. So here we go. I put it in PowerPoint, make it easy for me to get to kind of organize it all. So first, I want to start with an example. Uh, the average age of Chinese home buyers in 2018 was 29 and a half. So let's just call it 30 years old. A younger average compared with the rest of the world. It suggested a recent report on a survey of Chinese home buyers in 2018, the Economic View app reported on January of 2019. So let's just say the average age of a Chinese home buyer is 30 years old, at least for this article. In 2020, this is the demographic uh, of China, and we can see uh, females and we can see males, and then the dark shaded regions are the surpluses of males. In if the average age of 30 is 30 years old and in 2020 the average kind of peak here we want to see this demographic go up is about 30 what do you think happened in 2020 2021 well they should have a housing market crash if that data is accurate and what did the chinese see in their markets because what happened was the demographic really fell after age 30 in 2020. So in 2020, 2021, 2022, we should see a crash happen in Chinese real estate from the demographic coming back down to a much lower level. Uh, what would do well in those types of conditions as this comes in here would actually be the technology sector in China. It's not gonna be a gigantic inflation, high interest rate boom like they had before. So what do we see? It says the Chinese Communist Party wants the property bubble back. So they had a bubble. Uh, personal and political fortunes were made in two decades of real estate madness. Two decades. Well, let's go back and look at the, the thing here. So this would be, for, for two decades, you take 30, add it to about, so 40 and 50, we had a large move in increasing population growth. That's the boom that they're talking about this increase in population growth. So that's the two decades of real estate madness. Ch China is finally trying to fix its housing crisis. After a year on the sidelines, Beijing this week took steps to get hundreds of billions of dollars into the hands of the country's flailing real estate developers. It says, given the challenges faced by China's property market are largely structural, slower income growth, population aging, we expect the land sales revenue to continue to be under stress down the road. It's because of the demographic guys. That's what's driving this. That's why they had a real estate property market bubble and crash. The demographic came through, went through home buying years, and then it crashed behind it. They built too many homes, and there was a property bubble. Now, the average age in America, 36 years old, says, but, it, but is there a right age? when these factors should be in place. But in 2022, the average age of the first time home buyer in America was 36 years old. According to the National Realtors, this is up from 33 in 2021. So somewhere in the mid to, I'd say about mid thirties 
35 if you want to round it, 36, something on the lines of that. More data. Uh, the U.S. housing market is short 6.5 million homes. This was published March 8th, 2023. It says, however, if the rate of total housing starts, including both single-family and multifamily building, increased by 50% from the 2022 rate to an average rate of 2.3 million housing starts per year, it would take between two and three years to close the existing 2.3 million home gap. Assuming an average rate of household formations over the past decade of about 1.3 million households per year, that's your average, the report found, this would take building back to levels seen in the early 1970s and some of the peak months for building in the mid 2000s. So we need to drastically increase housing starts to a level of 2.3 million housing starts per month, per year, for about two and three years, somewhere in that range. That is what we could do to catch the housing market back up. So we've got the total U.S. population by age and generation. This is what it looks like. What we're looking for is a ramp from a low level up into a larger demographic. This demographic here, if you were to add uh, 35 years, roughly 35, 36 years for first-time home buyers, add it to this larger demographic here, that's really where you're going to peak out, roughly speaking, in your real estate property bubble. So when looking at it, what we'd see is we see this guy, come; it gets kind of lean here, but then it grows back out to about 30, 34 here. So this is 2023. If we take 30 years old, add six years to it, well, that puts you at around 2029. 2028, 2029, somewhere in that range is where we would peak out in terms of the demographic uh, wanting to buy homes coming in and the peak of first time home buyers would be at that level. Um, I understand that some of these people, these are the people that make up the demographic, are going to pass away, uh, but it's much less than this demographic that's coming up. So less homes are going to come on the market uh, to fill this big gap here of what's coming. So we are going to be in a shortage. Um, that is six and a half million homes is what we're short. And we, we could make that up over a two to three year time frame at a rate of 2.3 million housing starts. So we look at the 18-year property cycle. Now, there's some things that that people uh, talk about. They say, well, the 13, the 18-year property cycle, um, and it has to be 18 years. It doesn't have to be 18 years, guys. This is just a, an approximate. It is an approximate. This cycle has, it's got a couple levels. This is a recession. This is a hyper supply phase. This is your recovery phase. This is your mid-cycle slowdown or wobble. And then this is another big move where we, we go on up. Now, some people are going to debate the timeframes here. That is what we want to find out. Where are we in this real estate cycle? Some people are going to say, oh, we're over here. And I'm going to argue we can't be over there. It's impossible to be over there. Why is it impossible? How the heck can you be in a hyper supply when you're short six and a half million homes? We have not built the homes. We do not have the inventory. So the, anyone who takes that, that stance, the, the bearish stance, they cannot describe away that fact. We either don't have those shortages, the deficit, or the inventory numbers are completely wrong. That, that is where you'd have to be if you're a bear. Uh, could we have a slowdown? We could have a slowdown, yes, with interest rates going up, uh, maybe to an unsustainable level, but that's an argument for a mid-cycle slowdown. That's not an argument for a winner's curse peak in a hyper-supply phase. By definition, when you say hyper-supply, you actually have to have supply. You can't be in a low supply area, and I'll show you that data coming up, and be in the winner's curse phase. So just because we had uh, an accelerated amount of uh, home prices doesn't mean that it puts us in the bubble top. It means it can still put us in the mid-cycle wobble. 
we kind of we could have came down we could have distorted this in the middle here and that's my take i think we've got a distorted middle mid cycle like it, it's distorted in here because they did qe in the middle of the cycle some people say, you know, here's the mid-cycle dip. Maybe we're coming back up from that mid-cycle dip. It says you are here, and we haven't even gone through the expansion phase yet. We haven't built the homes. That is where I think we're at. That's where some other people think we're at who are very close to the real estate cycle. You can't learn about the real estate cycle necessarily from finance, guys. You kind of have to go into the real estate market, look under the hood there, in my opinion. So why do I think that? Why, what's driving all this? Um, why did we go over demographics and all that stuff? Well, let's look backwards to look forwards, to understand the cycles and the history of what's happened before and try to make predictions based off of just looking at demographics. Uh, so the demographics, this is the annual percent change in the U.S. population. I know we're looking at percent change. What I'm looking for is not necessarily the volume of people coming through it's the shock to the market where you where you get a large percent increase that's creating these kind of bubbles the volume is there and the volume will increase as you go to the right as the population increases so we're looking for our sharp spikes in annual change of po us population and remember you have to add your your home buying, first time home buyer's age to the birth date of the people. So if you add, and back here is probably 20 or 25 years old is when they were buying homes. If you add 25 years to people who were born in 1920, and if their first time buyers were buying, that would put it 1945. We had a large spike in 1945 all the way till let's say the mid 1940s, late 1940s, somewhere in that range. So there was a spike in the 40s. There's a spike uh, here. So you could say this is from 1969 or so, all the way to a peak of 1980 or 81. That's another big spike with a slowdown in the middle of this. You have three distinct waves, wave one, wave two, wave three of this population uh, percent change. Then we went into a large decline from 1980 uh, all the way till 1970. Remember, add, that's 2000. This is the year 2000 here. We had another spike in 2000 um, leading into roughly you know the mid 2000s. So maybe 2000 to 2005, we had a spike, came back down. And then we've got a large spike uh, add 30 to 35 years to this. Uh, that's 2020, all the way up to add 35 years or so to it. And this is going to be uh, out in, I don't know, if you add 35 years to 95, that puts you at like 2030. All right. So 2020 to 2030, we should have another large boom in real estate here based off of the annual percent change in the U.S. population. That is what we should see. So 1940s, 1970s, 2000, and here, the 2020s. So we go back and we look at the housing starts. This is a long-term annual U.S. housing starts from 1890 to 2015. In a fractional reserve lending system, what I am claiming is that the inflation would grow at, with the housing starts. So if you go from a low level, there should have been very large inflation in the 1920s with a subsequent crash somewhere happening when this goes below the average in 1929 here. We should have a 29 crash. We should have a big boom market before that in the 1920s, a crash in 1929. We should have another bull market in the late, kind of the late mid 30s, potentially another crash. In the mid-1940s, with that big demographic that I was talking about, this demographic here, that pushed us all the way to an entirely new level. We should have massive inflation in the late 1940s. Late 1940s, big inflation. We came into another inflationary period in the 1970s, where we went to another new all-time high in lending and annual housing starts. We should crash again in the 
uh, mid-1970s, boom again in the late 1970s, crash again, and potentially boom again in the mid-1980s. We also have a very big move from 1990 all the way to 2005. That was another big move with a mid-cycle wobble in here and a big old move to the upside. 2005 was the peak of the annual housing starts, then it declined, and we should have a crash when we go below the average in 2008. There's about your average here, new average. That is what we should see. So let's see what we see here. 1940s, big inflation. There's your big inflation of the 1940s. Big inflation from the 1940s. You can also see uh, we should have inflation. I don't know if this is late 19, you know, 1918, 1920s, something like that. So here's 1920, and then it came back up with inflation here, and then it crashed. So this is the inflation from the 1920s. This is the inflation from the 1940s. This is the inflation late 60s all the way into the 70s with that demographic. We should have a little bit of an inflation in the, late two, in the early 2000s here. That's the little inflation there. It wasn't a very big one. The big inflation booms there. This is your long-term interest rates. So big inflation in the 40s, big inflation in the 70s. What happened? It bottomed in 1940, and we had big inflation during that entire market move. In the mid-1940s, it started to move, and we moved all the way up based off of, in my opinion, the demographic that pushed the housing starts to these new levels. So it was the real estate market that was pushing this interest rate, I think. Uh, we could also see that we were in a declining interest rate from 1920s all the way down in the Great Depression. So that was a mini bull market in the 1920s here. We didn't have a big enough, this wasn't a huge bull market there in lending. We were coming down. In the early 1900s, which I don't have the data there, you can see we had some big inflation back here. Uh, we also had that inflation. So, and I don't know if I have that 1910s, it'd be the people that were born back here, but 1910s were, was this era in here. Um, annual private U.S. housing starts per 1,000 households. You can see roughly the average is around 22 and a half or so in here coming across. Uh, we've been way under that in the late 1990s, 2000s, 2010s. We've been building less homes. Uh, maybe that's a case for people dying and some people moving into older homes. That could maybe be the case, uh, but we are underbuilt. According to this, we are not, we're below the average for a period of time. Same with the 1930s. So the, the early 19, late, eight, night, late 1910s, early 20s, uh, 1930s and 1940s, we're underbuilt and we're underbuilt here. Uh, this is the U.S. real house housing prices from 1900 to 2019. Uh, we can see house prices in the booms. This was that mini boom that we had in the 1920s and then the crash in the 1930s. Uh, this is a much larger boom as we went to an entirely new level in the 1940s with that shock of the demographic coming and all those buyers coming in. We also had the 1970s and as those waves as that those demographics came through and bought homes. We had a big surge here. We did lower interest rates. We did do all that stuff to promote uh, this big boom. We also did very poor lending standards. <laughs> very poor lending also occurred here, which created that bubble. We came back down. Uh, we went into a recovery phase, and we've been in a recovery phase, in my opinion, here. That's all recovery phase. They've also been printing a lot of money and put a lot of money injected into the system. So when looking at the this cycle, just to remember this, this cycle here, let's look at what the inventory levels were doing. So in the 1940s, which isn't on this chart, but we had the 1970s. And you can see that we went into basically a housing surplus in the mid-1970s. It rocketed higher, and we went into a surplus and came back down. We rocketed higher, went into a surplus, came back down. So each of these um, moves, mid-1970s and, and early 80s, mid-1970s, that's the, the crash here. It, it boomed again in prices, and we came back and we crashed. We boomed again in the, in the 80s, came back down and crashed. This was the, the housing prices, and you can see the demographic. That's the demographic here. One second. It's the housing starts in, interacting with the demographic. The 1940s boom, the 19, early 1970s boom, 
the mid 1970s boom, and then the 1980s boom. That is the prices moving higher in each of these waves. So we had uh, early 1970s, the, the, the crash. Now this crash, each one of these crashes was accompanied by high inventory before it. High inventory, crash. High inventory, crash. High inventory, crash. Those are all crashes with high inventory levels. And we also had a crash with 2008. Now, where are our inventory levels today? We're at three months. We're below this entire curve. We are lower than anywhere on this curve right now. We are off the chart to the downside of number of months for our inventory levels. Here's our monthly supply of new houses in the United States. And some people point to the new houses and the monthly supply of new homes. They point to 8.9 months and say, look how high this is. Look how high. It's as high as the 1970s in the, the mid-1970s, as high as the 80s. And we had crashes back here. Well, in, in the mid-1970s, we had a bunch of homes. So these homes were converted to existing supply as well. They were adding to that supply. So we were at eight, 10 months of supply and a high monthly supply of new homes. In the 1980s, we also had that. Look at that, high monthly supply. So these homes were finished, completed homes sitting in inventory. This here, 10 months, is 10 months of inventory. So these are all new homes coming into the system and creating this big monthly supply of existing single family months of remaining inventory. They overbuilt, they were in a hyper supply. So hyper supply phase, hyper supply phase. We had one in the early 1990s. There's your 1990s. We had high home builds and high inventory. Every time we had those two, we crashed. High, very high monthly supply, off the chart high in, in 2007, eight. High inventory. 2007 8. But what if we have three months of inventory way down here? We're off the chart low, but we have high, high monthly supply of new houses. The monthly supply of new houses, guess what? Are not converted to inventory. So we have existing inventory that's off the charts low, and we have a high monthly supply of new houses, which are not completions. They are not done. That's if they're done and they don't sell, they would be stuck in inventory on the existing home side because the home exists, but they're not. We are at three months of inventory, and this is, this is the homes that are being built. They're not completed and finished. So let's go to, um, so this is a setup, right? If we look at U.S. stocks versus bonds returns, we can see three clear areas where we had negative U.S. stock returns and negative U.S. bond returns, 31, 69, and 2022. 69, so if we look back and we look at home prices, 1969 was right here at the bottom. We were going higher in this time frame. 19, uh, well, we had 22, 22, we have low inventory. 69, we have uh, low inventory in 69 here before a big move in inventories, uh, creating that the cycle was actually building new homes. Uh, 1969 was uh, right here, roughly, before we went higher in interest rates. Uh, we had 2022 is not going to be in the chart, and we had 1931, but 1931 was different because they readjusted the gold price. So that was a different era, and that readjustment messed with bond prices and stock prices when they went through that readjustment. And that was that big spike in interest rates here. It's this big spike right there, big spike in interest rates that caused that. <clears throat> this is your commodity to equity ratio. And remember those, those times, the early 1970s, that was a big housing market boom and an increase of interest rates. Another housing market boom with an increase of interest rates in 99 to 2000. These are the expansionary phases during those timeframes. 
We had an expansionary phase in the mid-1970s. What happened? We built too many homes. We crashed back down. And then, and then the late 70s, we came back up to another very high level. So that was that cycle coming through. And then obviously the cycle ended. Uh, we also had a big spike in 1990 where commodities outperformed equities. 1990 is this big bubble here. It's the big move of this move here. So that move also had a bunch of inventory. So the, the end of each of these commodity cycles, bunch of inventory of homes, 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 and it all crashed back down. Are we going to get a move to the upside? And what does that basically align with? It, it aligns with the expansionary phases of real estate, period. Every single commodity boom that we had in history, these, this move here, this move here, this move there, all coincided with a larger demographic and coincided with a boom in real estate housing starts. Boom in real estate housing starts. Boom in real estate housing starts. We had another boom in real estate housing starts before the crash. And we had too much inventory uh, on each of these levels. So your sell point is too much inventory and the decline of that inventory. We need to get out. The decline of that inventory, get out. The decline of the housing starts. The, the all that stuff. Here's your commodity booms. These are also analogous to the increase of the demographic, those big increase shock pulses of percent change of demographic or population growth. Um, and this is what the S&P 500 did during those time frames. They went sideways, it went sideways. And I'm guessing that this is probably going to go sideways up here. Why? Because of the demographic boom that we're seeing here. That's that big demographic boom. Now, these were big shocks to the system that caused a lot of interest rate hikes all through here. Interest went up because of the demographic, the population coming through into home buying years and into peak spending years. It all pushed that. And this, that's what's going to happen here. It's the same thing. And we have that alignment for the commodity to stock ratio that's cheap. We also have the alignment that each of these, the beginning of these commodity bull markets, had the same market conditions. We're cheap here for the commodity to equity ratio. And they, they go up during a commodity boom happens when you get those expansionary phases of real estate. It's, it's the rotation of money that it's, that it's causing. It's not demand and supply. I mean, it could be demand and supply because they're coming into peak spending years as well. But it's that inflation coming into the system and high increase of interest rates that is also causing it. So it's, it's a combination of both things. We can also see like gold against the S&P 500 is ultra cheap. And what happened during this? Now, this was a revaluation. I don't know if this is a legit, you know, kind of move there, but there was a revaluation here. And what happened in the 1960s, late 1970s? We had an energy crisis in 1970, and we had credit expansion from that demographic and that expansion phase of real estate. We had another expansion phase from 2000 to 2008. We had some stimulus put in the system that pushed this to 2011. So we had that move there. And then we have another demographic that's coming that's going to push this higher when we have to build all those homes and put new loans against them. Uh, this is the gold to M2 money supply. It's the same situation. Big double bottom uh, occurring. We've got platinum that's putting in a big pattern, ready to break to the upside. That is also indicating that we're going to see a big move to the upside eventually. This is going to happen immediately. Uh, we can see that the U.S. 10-year, 2-year, these are the recessions, right? Now, let's pair this up. So a recession starts to get priced in when the curve yield curve steepens. What happened in 1989 when this yield curve went down and it came back up? What happened in 1989, guys? We know this. We were just looking at all the inventory chart. 1990, what happened to inventory? We were in a bubble. We were in a bubble and it, and it cracked and came back down in the early 1990s. So what happened there? In the early 1990s, oh, the yield curve uninverted in the early 1990s and we had a recession. Well, what about this recession? So we came in, uh, we came all the way back down and in 2000, 2001, we came all the way back up. We had a recession, but it wasn't driven by the real estate market. In 2000, I can show you what that looks like. We had low housing starts in 2000. We did not have that big boom. The boom did not occur yet. 
And we can see it in the in the single family months of remaining inventory. We had low the, the inventory was slightly below average. There was no boom in the housing market. No boom in inventory, no boom in housing in 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 housing starts. Wherever I had that. Anyway, let's go back. Coming back here, what do we we have an inverted yield curve that came all the way back down to kind of average in 2018. We came back up. Um, that was a slowdown in the middle of a real estate recovery phase, in my opinion. We were not building a ton of homes at that time. We came back down because the, the housing market pushed. We had inflation, and this curve more or less just reacts to, I think, uh, inflation. Now, this curve can come back up, and we can get a recession. Uh, much like 2000, 2001, even though the real estate market isn't driving that. We can't predict that. We This could easily go down and, and move lower and invert even more. So what this is basically telling us is it's telling us where we are in the cycle to some degree, to some degree of the business cycle. It doesn't mean that the real estate cycle is necessarily driving it. But since we don't know, almost always, if the real estate cycle crashes, the and we go into a recession, the the real estate cycle. It's going to bring everything down. Uh, that's a deleveraging phase. We don't have the inventory for a housing market crash, in my opinion. Uh, we are off the charts cheap in terms of our inventory of three months. So we could have a recession. We could have a slowdown, but it's not being driven by real estate because we don't have the inventory to go into hyper supply phase like every single time in history. We went into these hyper supply phases and then the, the crashes all occurred after that. And that's what these crashes are. That's what the recessions are. It's a recession. Each time we, we get into these big inventory level areas, that's like a for sure sign that that bad stuff is coming. So we come down, it says, what do you mean inflation is dead? So now we're looking at more data, right? We're looking at different areas, more market conditions. Um, what this is, is this is oil and yields. 10-year yield in a bull era. Uh, we went into a large paradigm kind of shift in 19, early 1980s. Uh, this was the bottom of commodities, or I mean the bottom of stocks in 1982. And this is where you want to load up in stocks and ride this 40-year downtrend lower in the stock market. We also had every single alignment in stocks at that time where stocks basically said that stocks were cheap. Stocks to commodity ratio. Um, all those different things. And the demographic is what caused partly the interest rate to go down that much and really push that that move. And it was this move from 1980, add 30 years, 1980 or so, all the way down to 2020, add 30 years to about here. And that's when things start to heat up, add about 30 to 36 years. So we're in the thick of this buying demographic right now and it's hard to like put all these slides together like perfectly uh so that's where we're at we're, we're coming back down we are retesting in my opinion the oil price this is oil um oil went bonkers you can see when it went bonkers when the 10-year yield was going up and that demographic was coming uh into home buying years the credit was coming into the system the inflation the increasing interest rates all that stuff goes with an increased demand for oil. I think that same dynamic is coming ahead of us based off of the demographic, based off of the shortage or deficit in the housing market, based off of the correlation of an expansionary phase of real estate to a commodity bull market of those phases. Um, we can also see, and I grabbed this, these are all North Star bad charts, kind of longer picture moves. We can also see that we saw these downward movements each time we had these commodity bull markets. Uh, this is the S&P 500 divided by the producer price index. Um, these moves don't move straight lower. You can see that they kind of cycle up and down as they go. So we had a big move lower in the early 1930s that was also a major uh, bull market for commodities uh, as the producer price index outperformed the S&P 500. We had another large S&P 500 bull market in the uh, late 40s, all the way in the 50s and 60s. And then when that demographic came into home buying years, 
in the 1969 era, we broke down. We came back down. So we had a large demographic uh, in this era. We also had another move lower in the 2000s. And then again, we had another, we have another possible move lower here, smaller recession potentially coming uh, like we had in the early 2000s, like we had in the 1970 era. But remember, the demographic is what really pushed this. The demographic, it came in and came out of, of and, we, and we built too many homes. So these recessions are driven by the real estate market. And, and that's where we got these recessions here. We, we, we overbuilt, came back down. We overbuilt, came back down. We overbuilt, came back down. We're at three months of inventory right now. So I, in my opinion, it's not going to come. This recession isn't from the real estate market. And you can't say that we're 100% going to have a near-term recession. I think that's really difficult to make that claim. And you won't know that until I think you look backwards if we have this recession. So I am staying long in commodities because of the data that I see here. It's not crystal clear that we're gonna go into recession like it was in the 1970s when we overbuilt, overbuilt, and overbuilt. We're not overbuilt. We don't have the existing inventory. It's not there. So I'm gonna remain long in commodities for this bull market over the, the next 2020s. So, so that's what we're seeing in the markets right now. The demographic is there to buy. The commodity to stock ratio is cheap. It's, it's all aligned. Uh, the precious metals to, to whatever ratio you want to measure it against, against stocks, against all these different things. Cheap, cheap, cheap. So when we look at this, and if the housing market still looks good and, the and we're in the, in the thick of a demographic and we've got a good percent change, well, the, the bull market is still on. And it doesn't mean we go straight higher, though. We have to move, uh, you know, and, and do whatever the market is, and people are going to have to figure this out. The people are trying to figure out, you know, is this a recession? Do we run rotate into tech stocks? Uh, what I think is going to happen is we're going to get a slowdown if real estate reengages when they if they were to lower interest rates or something like that. Then I think all the money is going to shift back towards commodities again, based off all these long term technical analysis charts, based off of the SPX to PPI ratio here. I don't think this is done going down, which means we're still in a commodity bull market. But timing this like short-term recession, if we, if we get one, we may not. I don't know. And nothing here is 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 a screaming, you know, like from from the real estate market. And if the really the real estate market is really the driver of a lot of this, because that's where your credit expansion and contraction comes from. If you don't get a credit ex uh, if you don't get a credit contraction, you may not get a recession. And that's where it's like, uh, but we usually get a slowdown at the beginning of a commodity bull market because interest rates start to creep up and things start to slow down as, as money shifts and tries to figure out this new uh, paradigm that comes along. So again, I don't have all the answers, guys. What I'm showing you is the data that I'm looking at and how I'm making my decisions and why I'm staying long. Um, I don't think there's much data for the contrary, for like a blowout, like really long de decline in commodities for like a decade. We could see a slowdown for a period of time, but that's not going to hold commodities down for a decade. And every time I look at history, what I look at is the demographic coming through home buying years, which pushes all this stuff to the upside. The, the commodity and precious metal stuff is what I'm talking about. Everything I, I look at that I can find data-wise from big long-term, big picture views is basically saying that, that commodities are cheap and that they're going to go into a bull market. Um, all of the patterns that we see on a long-term perspective of platinum, gold, silver, uh, anything that you want to name in precious metals and commodities all look good for a move on up. Uh, but that does not mean that it's immediate. It does not mean that it is going to be in the next five, six months even. These are all big picture view, big long-term uh, charts. So I'm going to remain long 
until that until the demographic comes through until the houses are built uh if we were to build at 2.3 million steady for two and a half years that's going to be your expansion phase and i don't know how fast i don't know how fast we can build these homes it might be drawn out for five years six years if we only get to 1.7 1.8 million homes so it's going to take longer to make up the the deficit if we build at a slower pace over average and that's that's where we don't know like we don't know what the housing starts are going to look like um we don't know that now let's just look at this from a logical perspective all right let's just kind of look at it so if we're at three months of inventory uh, and if we were to look at our inventory levels let me let me try to find uh inventory levels real quick so you guys can see it so this is a uh, real estate inventory inventory months of supply so if we were to go and we were to look at our inventory levels so this is our inventory uh, months of, of supply of inventory actual and it's it's very very low right now so this is 2011 i'll copy this i'll put it in the um the thing here So, so this is our months of inventory going on right now. So you can see this is 2011. We were at nine and a half months. We had to work all that inventory off. What this is indicating here, and we're all, we went all the way down to one and a half months at this time frame. We're at three months or so right now, roughly speaking. This right here, this decline in inventory is signaling that this is a recovery phase and that our housing starts, if you were to look at our housing starts start to kick up here, you can see that the that's months of supply. I don't have housing starts here. Actually, I do have housing starts. Housing starts started to kick up. I don't have a, a most recent one. Housing starts started to kick up recently. And now we're at 1.6 million. So just think about this. Housing starts, and we can say the, see the monthly supply of new homes here. The month supply of new homes is kicked up. This is, we went we real low here because they shut everything down. You can see this trending higher here in our month's supply of new homes. We're building more homes, building more homes, building more homes. Now we're building a lot more homes. See this big jump in new home builds here? We're building a lot more new homes. And this inventory or months of supply is going to go up and up and up if we're going to build more new homes. And our housing starts have been going up on average, on a trend line higher. So think of it from a big big picture perspective, all right? So our inventory was declining from 2011 all the way to the lowest level ever in history in 2020. We had a big boom because we had interest rates that they held down and we were at an era, an area with very low inventory at the beginning of an expansionary phase of real estate. So then they rate they they increased interest rates the fastest pace ever to slow it all down, which they did. They slowed it down for sure. But the homes haven't been built. There's no inventory of existing homes. And we still have a deficit of 6.8 million something-ish homes, depending on where you look. So if, if we have to build the homes to satisfy this cycle to get into a hyper-supply phase, why do you think that we are going to be, why, why do you think real estate's going to crash? Put it in the comment section why real estate's going to crash with low existing inventory and a bunch of homes that we haven't built yet. Why do you think that this one time is gonna be different than every other time in history? Because every other time in history, we built the homes, we satisfied the demand, we went into a hyper supply phase, we had excess amount of existing homes in inventory, and it crashed. Why is this one time different than all of those other times? Because it's not. We're not in a housing bubble. We're not gonna crash and we have to build the homes. If we build the homes, it's gonna be inflationary. Now, can the interest rates slow them down? Definitely it can. Could we get a recession in the near term that isn't related to the housing market? Yes, we can. Now, who knows that? And how do you time that? No one knows if we're gonna go into recession and no one knows how to time it. Then don't time it. If Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett say, don't listen to market forecasters, forecasting, certain things stay long if it's cheap commodities are cheap i don't see anything relating to the overall markets of a crash from the real estate market i'm going to stay long 
I'm going to stay along, and that's what it's going to take uh, to ride through this is to, to look at this type of data. Um, if you guys like this type of data, I go over it every once in a while, uh, kind of refresh everyone a couple weeks uh, up to a month. I might go and, and go through this thesis data, big picture view, um, demographics, and all that stuff, and add different information into it. But hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Give me a thumb up. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website if you guys like this type of analysis. Finding-value.com. Uh, join our membership or join our community. Um, you can use the word discount and coupon code if you'd like. Uh, we do have a platinum question and answer session, 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. You can go there. You can ask me questions directly through a Zoom meeting. Um, the Zoom link is on the website. If you become a member, you can see where it's at. And you, can, you can join those Zoom meetings. And then you can, we, we talk about all this stuff. You can ask a bunch of questions. We talk about individual companies, all that stuff. So that's what we've got for today, guys. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. That's, that's, that's about it. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. This is Finding Value.